working with uh, Ronnie Hawkins' uh, band, they already had a guitar player. His name was Robbie Robertson. And so he decided that he would be the drummer because they had a bass player, they had a guitar player. So I don't know how much he had played the drums before that, but he became probably one of the top five rock and roll drummers, I think, of all time. But he also played a number of instruments. He played guitar, he played harmonica, he played mandolin, he played the drums. Uh, there was not much that Levon couldn't do musically. And I think he was, he, he was a walking biography of American music. Uh, this, this guy, was, he knew bluegrass as well as he knew country, as well as he knew rock and roll, as well as he knew R&B. He could play it all. And he was also just a fascinating guy to be around and to talk to and his stories growing up in Turkey Scratch, Arkansas, you know, cotton farm. I mean, he, he would tell me stories about when he was a teenager and going to, driving up to Memphis when he was like 16 years old and seeing a guy who had never played there before and it was Elvis Presley in a club. Um, you know, things like that, and Muddy Waters and Lightning Hopkins and all of these early influences that he had. And, and he, he had an amazing uh, ability to remember songs and lyrics. And, uh, and you just, you couldn't, you couldn't get enough of it when you were around Levon. He was just a wonderful guy. And we remained friends right up to the time he died. Um, and I think uh, he was probably the heart and soul of the band. He was he was the he was the leader of the band when they first started, uh, even though he wasn't the lead singer per se. I think Richard Manuel was considered the lead singer, but you know they switched around singing lead. But I think Levon really is the most um, known for the, his his singing. And as I always tell people, that having been an ex drummer, um, singing and playing drums at the same time. It's no easy task. It's, you know, it's kind of like this. <laughs> it's really hard, and you can <laughs> And nobody could do it better than Levon. He was just, he was incredible. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, let's move on to, to Janice. And uh, you really had uh, quite a relationship with her. In yeah, Janice, oh gosh, Janice. You could talk about Janice for hours and never get to the end of it because she was a one of a kind. Um, she, there was nobody like Janice. She she was a, so complicated, and she had uh, she had two distinctly opposite sides of herself. You know, her public side and her private side. She, as you probably all have heard, stories of her growing up in Port Arthur, Texas, and having been bullied and um, treated really badly by kids in school and also by her family. And she couldn't wait to get out of there. And she, um, I mean, when people ask me what was she like, I, I, I say she was, uh, she, she was like a bigger than life figure, kind of. You know, she walk into a room and it would just, she, there's two people that I worked with like that, uh, where they would come into a room and all the energy would just uh, just go to, the, to that person. Whether, whether they knew who you were or not, it was just kind of this charisma factor. And it was Janice and Chris Christopherson. And, and Janice was just so energetic and full of life and funny and cute. And that whole personality that she had was absolutely compelling. And then there was the other side of Janice, which was this kind of hurt, broken, little girl from Texas who was insecure and worried about the future all the time and sad uh, a lot of the time and lonely. And she used to say, I go on stage and I make love to 2,500 people and then I go home alone. Um, so she was, you know, she, she, was, she was both sides and, and two extremes. And, uh, and I think ultimately, it's kind of what got her in trouble. And uh, she, you know, when she passed, it was, uh, it was a real shock because we had been under the impression that she was totally off of drugs and she was off heroin anyway. 
And she had cleaned up. She had met a guy that she really liked, and they were talking about getting married, but he was totally uh, against drugs, and especially heroin. And uh, so when I got that call, I, it was like I, was, I couldn't believe it. And I'll never forget it. it was, I was living in Woodstock at the time, and uh, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from Albert Grossman, who, who was living there as well. And, and I, I answered the phone, and he said, Michael? I said, yep. I said, Janice is dead. And that was all he said. And, and so I said, uh, I said, well, I can't believe it. You know, and I said, where are you? And he said, I'm home. And I said, are you alone? And he said, yeah. So I said, uh, I said, well, I'm coming over. So I, I got my car and I went over there. And uh, he was, he was shattered. I mean, he and Janice were so close. They had a, a, a real love relationship as well as business. And he was like a father figure to her, to her, and um, and a protector. And he, she felt that he was. Uh, you know, he was really taking care of her. And, uh, and he felt really close to her, too. He, I think he shared that feeling. Albert didn't love a lot of people. Um, but I think he really did love Janice. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, I, I, we should talk about that guitar. Yeah, we do. I do want to talk about the guitar because that is the only three-dimensional artifact in the exhibit, and that's actually it's um, in the exhibit, and uh, it has a really great backstory. Yeah. Um, when was it? About recently, actually, in the last couple of months, uh, uh, a friend of mine who I worked with uh, at, at the Grossman office was a guy named Bob Newworth, and. I hadn't seen Bob in many years, and Bob was kind of the, he was a, he's a whole nother story that I could talk about for forever, but I won't. Um, but he was Bob Dylan's uh, best friend and his road manager. And uh, he was also very close to Janice, and he was close to a lot of different people. He was kind of an insider's insider. Uh, all of the musicians that you could name they all knew Bob, and he was kind of the life of the party. And he was a real funny, but acerbic kind of guy. If you were on the other end of his humor, it wasn't so funny sometimes, but he was, he was a real character. And he was, he's, every time you see anything about Bob Dylan in the early days, you'll see you know, New Earth standing next to him. Um, so I got a call from New Earth, and he had, seen some of the pictures somehow, somewhere, from maybe from uh, an exhibit that we had in California. And um, he asked me if I had any photographs of Janice playing guitar. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, I'll have to look. So I did, and we found about four or five photographs uh, of her playing this guitar. And I hadn't thought anything about it, but um, I called him back. He said, well, let me tell you the story about this. And he said, uh, when I was with, one day when I was with Chris Christopherson, he played me a new song he had written called Me and Bobby McGee. And uh, he said, I, I think this is a great song and I'd like to bring it to Janice, do you mind? So Chris said, no. And so he taught Bob how to play the guitar, the song on the guitar, because Bob, also played guitar. So he brought the song to Janice and went to her house and she had a guitar there and he said, I want you to, I want you to hear this song and he played it for her and she loved it. She says, I want to record it right away. I, I, it's great, it's perfect. And she we actually changed the gender of it. It was supposed to be about a girl named uh, Bobby McKee who worked at Monument Records with Fred Foster, which was Chris's publishing company. Um, so, as a thank you, um, Janice gave Bob a guitar, and it turns out that she only played that guitar in concert or in performance twice. Once when she went down to Nashville, she wanted to play it 
um, for the country guys down there because Chris was there. Uh, and then the only other time was up at the Madison Square Garden concert, which is where, where this was, um, photograph was taken. So um, I've searched everywhere and so has Bob Newirth and we've decided that the only pictures that are known of her playing a guitar in concert are, is this one and the other three or so that we have. So it's a reunion of a sort. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's also another fantastic photo of Janice uh, from that same. Uh, yeah, that, um, that photo, uh, I was taking some pictures of her for a little songbook that she, that she was going to put out, um, which was kind of a small project because she wasn't a songwriter as such. So it was mostly her songs that she recorded that other people wrote. So a songbook from somebody who's not, didn't write the songs was sort of less important than, <clears throat> than a, you know, if it was a songbook from somebody like, uh, you know, Dylan or Christopherson. Um, but anyway, she, we needed some pictures for that. So I shot some pictures and this was one of them. And um, it, I was kind of sad because she looked at it and she said, she said, oh my gosh, she says, that's one of the only pictures I've ever seen of me where I think I look pretty. Um, and so that, you know, that's been kind of a special picture for us. Uh, and that was also taken at this, at the Madison Square Garden concert. One of the amazing things too is just your access. I mean, you're really close to her. Where were you, where were you? When well, you I think that's one of the things about these pictures that kind of, um, separates them in a way from, from other photographers' pictures. Uh, you know, there's, there's some great photographers that took great photographs in, uh, um, for many years. I mean, there's guys like Jim Marshall and Henry Diltz, and, and those guys were real, you know, full-time serious rock photographers. But what I've sort of realized with my pictures is that because of my relationship with the artists, <clears throat> as, as a manager, and also as a friend, I was just there. I was part of the team. So, you know, I would have my camera with me. And I had no intention most of the time of doing anything with these pictures, except that I was taking pictures because I was interested at that point in photography and I was working with all these terrific artists. So I had full access. And I took a lot of these pictures on stage. I was probably 10 feet away from her, just far enough off stage so that I wasn't standing in the middle of the stage, but I was not, I wasn't s down in the pit, you know, where the photographers were, because those pictures were shot, usually you sort of looking up somebody's nose in most of those <laughs> pictures. But even the pictures I took of the, of the Rolling Stones, I, I was on stage when I took those pictures. So there's this kind of uh, different angle or different uh, perspective that you get from not having to be, um, you know, part of the press or, you know, a press photographer or a publicity photographer, because they don't have that kind of access. They can't just be sitting in the dressing room hanging out either, you know. Did anyone ever get self-conscious and say, you know, please don't photograph me, or was it just really pretty open for you? No, I don't think anyone ever said that to me. Um, that I can remember. I don't think I ever took pictures when I didn't feel like it was appropriate. You know, I don't think, I never stuck my camera in anyone's face. It was just, you know, I'd see a picture and, and I would snap it. And if, if it, I, I think if, if I thought somebody would not welcome it, I would, would not have done it or I would have stopped, you know. But in those days too, it was, it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't the way it is now where, you know, Photographers are in these people's face, and it's so invasive that I think there probably are a lot of people that say, now, you know, stay away from me. But um, no, I think it was just because of my relationship, basically, with them. Is there anything else you'd like to say about Janice before we move on? Oh, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, Janice. Uh, well, I could tell you a great story about Janice if you want to hear one. Anybody want to hear a fun story? Yeah. Okay, this is a great story. Um, 
when Janice, Janice had three bands in her career. She only had a career that lasted four years, believe it or not. That's how impactful she was. I mean, who else has a career that lasts four years with three albums of her studio albums? And that was it for the whole career. And she's, you know, she, she's been on postage stamps and she's still as impactful in a, in a way today as she was 50 years ago. But so Big Brother and the Holding Company, of course, was her first band. And uh, after, after that album was done, the consensus was that Janice had jumped so far out in front of everybody that, that the guys in the band were not really up to going to the next step in her career. So we put together um, the Cosmic Blues Band. And that was a, a band with horns and, you know, it was a bigger band and it was what Janice thought she wanted at the time. And it, it was a good band. And they made an album, uh, got them old Cosmic Blues again, blues uh, yeah, again. And so, uh, but that band didn't last very long either. It was just that one album. And then she decided uh, that she wanted to have a, she wanted to have a more compact group that was more of a rock and roll, less of an R&B kind of band. And so we helped her put together this band uh, called the Full Tilt Boogie Band. And that was the final band that she had before she died. And um, so we put this band together and we um, brought the guys all out to her house in California, in Larkspur, uh, near San Francisco, and rehearsed them for about, I think about a month, if my memory serves me. And <clears throat> at the end of that time, I said to Janice, I think, you know, the band sounds ready to showcase. Uh, you know, I think we should do, do, a, uh, do a gig, see how, it, see how it looks, see how it feels. And we'll do something low key that's not too important, and uh, you know, give it a test run. So she said that was great, and I said, you know, what do you think? Do you have any preference as to where you'd like to do something like that? Because she was from there, and she said, she said, yeah. She says, let's. I got an idea. Let's let's do a free uh, gig for the uh, Hell's Angels in San Francisco. Uh, I'm, I know a bunch of those guys, and. Uh, <laughs> They, they need to raise some money for their chapter. And uh, I think it would be great, you know? So I said, well, Janice, I said, I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> so she said, terrific. I'll tell the guys. And, and she says, and I'll get Big Brother and the Holding Company to open for us. So what could, go, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> We found this place called the Bermuda Palms. It was a dump motel <laughs> over in San Rafael. And it had a venue attached to it that held about 500 people or so. And the Hells Angels were thrilled, you know, this was gonna be, we thought they were gonna, it was gonna be a concert where people would buy tickets and go and the money would go to the Hells Angels and you know, they would be, have money, right? But they decided it was just for Hells Angels, only Hells Angels and they were gonna charge a dollar at the door oh, <laughs> for the chapter. Oh, <laughs> so if they were lucky, they could raise like upwards of $500 <laughs> for Janis Joplin concert. <laughs> the premier, you know, the first, the first gig for this new band that was about to make another album and you know, that was gonna be the, the, the result. So it was, it was a night that I describe as the craziest night of my life, and I have never changed my mind. I, I hope I never get in a situation that's crazier so that I would change my mind. But, um, so, oh my gosh. So this, this is really funny. Uh, we, we go over there, and we have Big Brother's now gonna open for her, and they've got, um, instead of Janice singing lead, they've got this guy, Nick Gravenitis, singing lead. Nick was a, a terrific blues artist. He's played guitar and he sings, and he's a pretty well-known artist, but not hugely known. But he was, so he was singing lead with, the, with the, her old band. 
And uh, Sam Andrew was there, and his, he had his arm in a cast. He had a broken arm. He was playing lead guitar. <laughs> but when we got there, I walked up to the venue, and there was, uh, it must have been, I don't know, two or three hundred uh, motorcycles that were just <laughs> circling the building. And there were three guys with shotguns <laughs> protecting the motorcycles. <laughs> God forbid you should touch a motorcycle, <laughs> you would be killed instantly. And uh, so I go inside, and there is everybody in the place is a hell's angel, and they're all in their leathers and their colors, and they're they're, and they're all drunk and they're stoned out, and they're carrying these little baggies that I thought they were. You know, like Skittles or something. <laughs> oh, wasn't Skittles. <laughs> and they were just taking them. They were just like reaching into each other's bags and take. you know. It, it just got progressively worse as the night went on. Everybody was like completely out of their minds. And, uh, and there was nobody there that was a civilian except for me and Albert Roseman and another guy from the office, Bennett Klotzer. And, that, and a friend of Janice is uh, Emmett Grogan, who had started the, that group, The Diggers, in San Francisco. It was one of these radical uh, left-wing things. I don't know what, what their MO was. I can't remember. But anyway, we were the only ones there that were not um, part of the Hell's Angels entourage. So I felt like I, you know, I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I, I had a target on me. You know? But so the... So that w what happens was the, where the Big Brother comes on, and uh, and this this was really something. They they start playing, and the crowd is is watching and they're interested and they're uh, having a good time. And all of a sudden, this girl jumps up on stage. It's a beautiful young girl, and she start she takes all her clothes off. Oh. So <laughs> I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> and they start to applaud now. Nick Rabinitis is singing on this song, right? And Nick never opens his eyes when he sings. It's like, you know, he gets into the song and he's... You know, and this girl starts, she takes all her clothes off. So the, all the guys, the Hells Angels are, yeah, man. <laughs> and uh, Nick is like thinking, man, I'm doing good. <laughs> he doesn't see it <laughs> on the side. So the next thing you know, I, I don't know if it was her boyfriend or just some guy jumps up on stage and he takes all his clothes off. Oh, oh, <laughs> now they're like getting really excited. You know? <laughs> they're stoned, so drunk, so stoned out on acid, on every kind of drug you can imagine. And now these two are up there dancing uh, with no clothes on. And Nick is still like, <laughs> and, now, and now Nick is thinking, Shit, man! I, I'm the star is born. <laughs> this is this is his this is this debut, man. He's gonna this is gonna be it for him. Well, it gets better. <laughs> they just the, the couple drops to the floor and oh, they no. start uh, having sex oh. on the floor on the stage. Oh, now the crowd is really going nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Nick still hasn't opened his eyes. <laughs> so, so they're over here. And Nick is like, he's just going crazy, you know? And he can't believe it. And, and then the song ends, you know, and everybody's screaming and yelling. And Nick opens his eyes and he looks down and he goes, oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> it, it was like he, like he was gonna, like he was bit by a snake. <laughs> and, and it was such, I, I just, I felt so sorry for him. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't about him. So anyway, this goes on for another minute, so bear with me because it still gets good. <laughs> so now I'm standing with all the Hells Angels and with Janice and with uh, Emmett Brogan and Albert. And uh, Janice is there and this girl is standing there and she's got a bottle of whiskey and a flask. Like, and she's swigging that and Janice says, hey man, Give me a swig of that. I gotta go on in a minute. I need a drink. So she reaches for the flask, thinking the girl's gonna give it to her, and the girl punches her in the face. Oh. Wow. So Janice punches her in the face. <laughs> now I'm thinking, uh, 
This is, how, how can things get worse? <laughs> they dropped to the floor and they're like beating the crap out of each other. Janice was, she was doing well. Uh, so I, I try to pull Janice off of the girl and, and uh, another guy who I was with, Bennett, He's helping me with that, and then the Hells Angel are pulling uh, the girl off of Janice, and we're trying to get him apart. We finally get him apart, and one of the Hells Angels says to the other Hells Angel something that he didn't like, they were pulling each other apart. And the next thing you know, they pull out knives. Oh. And the, the place is like packed, you know? And everybody starts to make a circle okay, oh, so that God. these guys can kill each other. Oh, geez. And they're circling each other with these knives. Now, I'm looking for the exit signs. <laughs> and, and I see one over a Marshall amp, and I'm thinking, can I jump high enough to get up on that amp and over the, trying to get out of there? And uh, the, all of a sudden, these guys decide they're not going to kill each other. They start hugging, and you know, like we're brothers, oh. and oh, we're doing this, man. You know, and was, they hug it out, and it was great. And then, five minutes later, Janice goes up on stage. It was the first time she ever played with uh, the Full Tilt Boogie Band, and I think it might have been maybe the best performance I ever saw Janice wow. give. Wow! Wow! Oh, what a great story. Wow. I assume there are no negatives of that. <laughs> <laughs> in a box anywhere. When I find those, I'll let you know. <laughs> what a great story. Um, we're going to move on to um, our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame um, nominee, Todd Rundgren, and his run session from 1970. Okay, Todd Rundgren. Um, Todd, uh, I met Todd when he was 18, as I mentioned earlier. He was playing in Philadelphia with uh, Naz. And um, Todd was, was, was a brilliant kid. He was very difficult to, to work with. And um, he, you know, he's had, he's had a very successful career, but I think he probably could have had an even more successful career if he had been a little easier to get along with. But uh, th this particular session was the run, uh, his first solo album when, uh, when we started Bearsville Records. Um, and we had a, a deal with Ampex, and we, I think Todd was the first album that we made. And it was his first solo album. So I think these pictures were probably the, the first pictures of Todd in the studio as a solo artist. And uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting was he's playing the saxophone. And we, we looked at these pictures, and I was thinking, oh my god, I forgot about that. because. Todd played every instrument and sang every part except for the two guys that were playing bass and drums, the, and they were Soupy Sales' sons. Um, so was, what were their names? Tony Sales and uh, Hunt. Hunt Sales, yeah. And in fact, I think, can you see? Uh, they're not in these pictures, but uh, other than that, Todd did the whole thing himself, and he came in one day with a saxophone, and we were, Nobody knew he play, he played saxophone, which he didn't. And but he <laughs> he figured out how to play a part, a simple part. He just came in and, and put it on the record, and it and it worked. Um, so these were I think Todd was probably 21 when he when these pictures were taken, and and that was a pretty good album. That, that uh, first album that they did was was significant. And, that was really the beginning of his solo career. That's great. Buddy Cage. Ah, Buddy Cage. He was a great guy. Still is, I hope. Um, this was taken in Osaka, Japan. Uh, we, he, Buddy was part of a group called the Great Speckled Bird, and they were backing up Ian and Sylvia, who we managed as well. And um, we... We were playing the uh, World's Fair in Osaka in 1970, and uh, I went over there with them, and I did the sound for the for the performance at the Canadian Pavilion, which were, we were the guests of the Canadian government. In fact, uh, Pierre Trudeau, Trudeau showed up, and we all got little medals, which I still have my medal. 
Um, and um, this uh, Buddy Cage was a pedal steel guitar player and, and went on to play with the New Riders of the Purple Sage for like 20 years or something. And he's, he's a really good guy and an uh, excellent musician. And uh, I just, I saw this on a break. He was sitting there and I just couldn't resist. It just, you know, I, I thought it was such an <laughs> interesting juxtaposition of, of the title up there. And I assume it's the same in Japanese over there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about documentary photography. And we have this shot from Festival Express. Oh, yeah. This is a, this is a, a picture from, um, this, I, I took this in Toronto, uh, the opening night of, or opening day of the uh, uh, Festival Express, which was a train that went across Canada in 1970. And on the train was the Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, the band, Buddy Guy, um, Ian and Sylvia, and somebody else. Um, but anyway, th that was the crux of it. And it was just a party from one end of Canada to the other. Um, no adult supervision whatsoever. <laughs> And this picture was uh, a protester being tackled by a Canadian Mountie um, because 2,500 uh, people showed up and crashed the gates and uh, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't settle down because they felt that the promoter was gouging on prices and the tickets were ten dollars. Um, so. Uh, Jerry Garcia had to get up and, and announce to the crowd that they would do a free concert in the park the next day in order to uh, quell the, the riot. And uh, so I just happened to catch this guy being tackled. Yeah. And that was, that there's a, um, if you go on YouTube, you can, or on uh, Netflix maybe, you can find the documentary about the Festival Express. Um, it was just out of control for a week. These guys lived on the train. They drank everything that they could possibly drink. They had to stop the train at one point because there was a liquor store there that they spotted. They stopped the train and they went and they emptied out the liquor store. You see guys with crates, you know, cases of booze. And there's a, there's a great segment in there with Janice and uh, Rick Danko from the band and Jerry Garcia just having a ball, just having the greatest time laughing. Who was one of the guys in the Grateful Dead said Woodstock was fun for the people, but the, the Festival Express train was great for the musicians. That was where it was the most fun. So that that's from that time. You sh I encourage you all to take a look at that documentary. It's really it's really fun. Okay, let's go back to Madison Square Garden and the Rolling Stones, 1969. It's a great shot. Lots to talk about. Wow. Okay, this, uh, this is a um, 1969 Rolling Stones, Madison Square Garden. <clears throat> I had sort of forgotten the progression of how this came about until recently. It was one of the things I mentioned earlier that we're still learning about. And it just came to me after uh, reading about um, a photograph that Emily uh, Rothschild took. And she was talking about this night. Um, to begin with, if you, if you look at the picture, uh, that's Madison Square Garden, if you can believe that stage is the size that it is and, and how close up the audience was. It, it, it was so small. I mean, nowadays, you, you, you couldn't get anywhere near the stage at Madison Square Garden. It'd probably be 10 feet in the air and it'd be huge. And so this, was, this is what it was like back then. And all of these girls would jump up on stage, and uh, and they would be dragged off by the road managers. And this one we call "Don't Forget Your Purse." Um, <laughs> so it, it, would, it was like nonstop. They had four road managers, and all they were doing was just waiting for the next one to jump up on stage. And if you see the guy with the camera, 
Well, that's one of the Maisel brothers, and his brother is, is, is up on the other side, in back of where Jagger is. And uh, they filmed it, and it is the, um, this was from the Get Your Yaya's uh, album, it was Gimme Shelter, and it was all shot at this concert. It's considered probably one of the greatest concerts ever, rock concerts. Um, you know, Dave Marsh and Robert Crisco both called it, you know, the, the first major rock and roll tour. And so I have pictures of, uh, that I thought were kind of pictures of Janice from this show. And I was wondering how, what the, what the story was. And, and through this picture of Amy, Emily Rothschild, she mentioned that Janice uh, had been in New York and was alone. And she, Janice wasn't on the bill, even though she sang at this concert, and I couldn't figure it out. But now I, it all came back to me, which was that Janice asked me if I would take her to the, to the Stones concert because she didn't have anybody to go with. She was in New York, and she was by herself. <clears throat> so I took her, and she was standing in the wings when Tina Turner was singing, and Tina saw her and called her onto the stage. And that's where Emily Rothschild's photograph came from. It was um, Janice and Tina singing together. And I couldn't remember you know, how that came about. Now I do, because um, I had abandoned her and was running all over Madison Square Garden taking f photographs of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> But um, that was that was how that came about. She wasn't on the bill, but she uh, she ended up singing a couple of songs. And BB King was also on that show, and it was it was incredible. That's another uh, documentary that you all ought to see if you're interested. And there's also another uh, shot from that same show. Mick Jagger. Yeah. Oh, this story behind that. God. This this picture was um, when I first got the contact sheets back on this roll of these rolls of film from this concert. It's the same concert. Um, I saw this picture and I thought it was I thought it was really interesting and good. So I I made a print of it and I sent it to Jan Wenner as a Christmas gift. And it's nineteen sixty nine. And um, about I don't know, maybe five or six months later, somebody sent me a copy of the David Dalton book called The Rolling Stones. And in there is a full page uh, of this picture. So I called up Jan and I said, hey, what's up? You, you re-gifted my, my Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, just, I just got this book and my picture's in it. And, and uh, this is the first I'm hearing about it. He said, oh, yeah, he said, I'm sorry, I, 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 I should have called you. Uh, but he said, I knew that Dalton was doing this book on the Rolling Stones, so I sent it to him. And he said, if it'll make you feel better, Jagger said it's the best picture in the book. So I said, OK, you're off the hook. <laughs> OK, next we have uh, Chris Christopherson and Rhea Coolidge. This is um, the Dean Martin show, right? Yeah, this is, uh, this is in the dressing room at the Dean Martin show. Um, 1973. Um, Chris and Rita had just gotten married recently, and she was doing gigs together with Chris, and he was doing gigs uh, on his own. And I think she was actually doing some on her own too. And she had had, you know, a number of hits um, on her own. Uh, Rita was a very well-known background singer and also uh, had her own recording career in California. And uh, she had that song, Higher and Higher. Um, and uh, she had two or three more major hits. Anyway, they were, they were great together on stage. And sort of hearing her singing his songs with him really made it, his songs sound better than when he sang them by himself. And he was the first one to <coughs> admit that. <coughs> but. So this was the Dean Martin show. He, we were supposed to um, do, I think, two numbers, and then he was supposed to have a little interaction with Dean. And uh, 
So we were waiting to go on, and there was a knock on the door in the dressing room, and I <coughs> opened the door, and it was a the script lady. Uh, so she handed me the script, and I was, you know, looking at what Chris was supposed to say to Dean, and I turned to Chris and I said, uh, "We can't do this." And he said, "Why?" I said, "Well, they, they've got you holding up a midget and making a joke." <coughs> In those days, they didn't call them little people. <clears throat> I mean, it was very little political correctness compared to today, but it was still offensive, and I felt that it was wrong, and Chris agreed. So we decided that we weren't going to do that. So he said, well, why don't you go up and talk to Greg Garrison and tell him that we're not comfortable doing this, and if he wants, I'll write something to put it in its place. So I think I was 24 five at the time. And Greg Garrison is this imposing, arrogant, self-righteous producer, Hollywood producer, and an imperious boss of everything. <clears throat> and I went up to him and I said, uh, I introduced myself and I said, you know, I've, we just, Chris and I were looking at the script and you know, we just don't feel that it's appropriate for him to be doing this. And Chris said, if you'd like, he would be happy to, you know, maybe write something in its place. <clears throat> so Garrison looks at me and he says, oh, is that what you and Chris think? So I said, yep. <laughs> he said, uh, so let me see if I got this right. You're now the producer and Chris is the writer, right? So I said, no, you know, I just, we're trying to be helpful. Chris was trying to be helpful. and." We just aren't comfortable doing this, and we don't want to do it. So he said, well, OK. He says, you're off the show. So I said, really? And he <laughs> said, yeah. So I said, OK. We'll get our stuff and leave. And he thought I was going to back down because I was a kid. And because also because I, I thought he was going to back down because it was a live show and it was going on in 45 minutes. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, um, so I go back down to the dressing room and I walk in and I see Chris is with Rita and he, uh, he's singing to her. And incidentally, when I, this was the one picture that I took that I clearly remember taking and I thought, this is a really cool picture because I caught her in the mirror. And he, um, and I just thought it was a good picture. So it came, all the memories came back easily on this one. <clears throat> so he, he looked at me, he says, so how did it go? And I said, uh, pretty good. I just got us kicked off the show. <laughs> so he said, really? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, okay, well, he says, I don't know about you guys, but I'm starving. Let's go to Pink's and get some hot dogs. <laughs> so I said, that's a great idea. And Pink's is this famous hot dog stand in LA that everybody goes to. And it's open like 24 hours a day. You go there at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you know, it was people lined up. So about five minutes later, a knock on the door, and it's Dean Martin, and he's half in the bag, and he's got a bottle of Jack Daniels. And he comes in and he goes, hey, what's going on in here? And Chris said, uh, well, we're just, we're just getting ready to go over to Pink's and get some hot dogs. You want to come with us? <laughs> and uh, Martin says, nah, he says, I got to stay here. I got the show to do. And so, so Chris said, oh, OK, well, anyway, Martin says, uh, here, let's have a drink. And the two of them started drinking out of the bottle. and. and kibitzing and making you know jokes and stuff and the next thing you know they're both half in the bag except I think by this time Dean Martin was fully in the bag <laughs> yes. and um, and then he says to Chris he says come on let's go upstairs and, and, and do this thing and don't worry about Greg Garrison I'll take care of him and, and that was the way it ended so I, I always loved that that ending and I went upstairs after that and I was standing up there off stage and, and Garrison was there and, and I just wish I had had my camera, because <laughs> it was a look you could not recreate. <laughs> That's awesome. James Cotton. Uh, my man. James, <clears throat> one of the nicest, sweetest men ever. Uh, 
he came to the office one day and uh, I, needed a, I needed a publicity shot of him for a new record that he was doing, you know, like an eight by 10 kind of thing. And so I said, uh, I said, let's go take a walk and see if we can get some, some pictures. So we, we walked over to the west side <clears throat> and we went down to where the pier, where the big ships come in, in in Manhattan on the west side. And you know those things that they tie up the ships to, those big pylons? Um, James just sat down on the pylon and he pulled out his harp. He started playing the blues. And I snapped that picture. And uh, I just always thought it was, it really looks like the guy that I knew, he was just, it just looks like James Cotton. He's, he was a wonderful guy. He, I think he just died in the last few years, last couple of years. But he was a, a legend and influenced everybody. He was probably the greatest harp player of all, blues harp player ever. I mean, there's a couple of guys, but Muddy Waters, and he was in very, very good company and uh, influenced all of the guys like Paul Butterfield and um, certainly all the white guys that were that turned into great uh, harp players. But James really was, he was just a special guy. And he played with Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and a lot of the very early uh, important blues artists of that period. You can almost hear him playing in that photo. It's kind of yeah, he's, he was great. He was a wonderful guy. Okay, here's one of you. Like That's another proof of hair picture. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that was in the very beginning of uh, when uh, we started the the Bearsville Records uh, company, and I was aware of Professor Longhair, who was a a legend in New Orleans. He was one of the major influences on God knows how many artists and crossing all kinds of borders and musically and um, and he, I think he told me one time that Fats Domino used to carry his suitcase that was his job when he was a kid and he taught Fats Domino how to play piano um, and so we I, I signed him to the to the record company and I brought him up to New York and we recorded 42 songs in four days. That was like unheard of. We had to stop recording because his fingers started to bleed at some point. And so I decided to bring the guys up to um, Woodstock. They had never seen snow before. Uh, and the guy next, so it was me and, and then Professor Longhair, his real name was Roy Bird, and that's Snooks Elin, who was a, a world famous guitar player uh, and next to him is Quint Davis who was managing uh, Long, Professor Longhair at the time and Quint is now the he, he does the jazz festival in New Orleans uh, New Orleans Jazz Festival he's the man down there but we we came up and we recorded all these songs and then we I brought him up to Woodstock and I played the album for Albert Grossman and uh, a couple of days after that Albert called me up and he said he wanted to take the tapes into the studio and have Robbie Robertson uh, post produce it, uh, overdub and remix and so forth. And I said, I, I don't agree to do it. Um, it's raw, it's, it's the way long hair, you know, he wanted, that's the way we, he wanted it to be, it's, it's live. It's not, it's not a production number, and uh, you know you might think it's good for Robbie's career, but I think it's a mistake for this album, and I don't want to do it. So he shelved the album, and it never came out. And um, it was probably one of the the major things that interrupted my relationship with Albert. You know, it, it hurt our relationship a lot, and it, and it was very painful for for these guys. Um, but that was, you know, he made a decision that I think was wrong, but that was kind of a sad ending to that story.
I don't necessarily want to end on a, a sad note with this, but so, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so um, you know, these photographs are um, basically uh, document five years of, of your career, but you uh, were in the music industry until 1985. Right. I, um, after Chris and Rita, it was about, I think, 1974, maybe, um, uh, I had sort of I decided I wanted to take a break from the music business. So, I, and I was in love with the antiques business and collecting and so forth. And that's that's the other thing that I was doing at the time. So I I quit the music business and became a full time antique dealer. Then about 1980, I just had a an urge to get back in. It was it was like one of those scenes from The Godfather, you know, just when I thought I was out, <laughs> pulled me back in. And um, I, so I sat down and I wrote Clive Davis a, a letter. And I, I hadn't seen Clive for, I don't know, 15 years probably. A long time since, since I maybe, well, no, maybe 10 years. Anyway, and I just said, you know, I, I have this urge to get back in the business and, you know, thought it would, might be worthwhile seeing if he had anything that he thought would be interesting for me. And so he called me up and said, uh, what are you doing on Friday afternoon? So I said, nothing. And he said, come on in. And he was reviewing an al a label that he was thinking of signing to Arista, a group of artists that he uh, that had presented themselves to him to so see if he was interested in taking the label on. So I went, I met him at this little club in the village, and um, he was there with all of the vice presidents of Arista, the department heads, and me. Uh, and I didn't know any of those guys. And um, so we watched this showcase of, I don't know, 10 artists or so. And uh, at the end of it, he just turned to me without saying anything to anybody else, and he said, so, Michael, what would you do if you were me? This was a test, I guess. So I said, well, if it were me, I would take the label on if it was cheap enough to buy, and I would drop everybody except one, one artist. And so he, he said, Lena, right? And I said, yeah. So he said, uh, well, when do you think you might want to start? So I said, I don't know, Monday? So he said, yeah. And so three days later, I was commuting to New York from Connecticut. <laughs> I was the executive vice president, or executive assistant to the president of Arista Records. I didn't even know what I was going to be doing. And I didn't even know what the job was. So I, I, went, uh, I went back into the business and worked with Clive for two years or so. and. Uh, and then I started a little production company after that with uh, Orleans, we managed and produced Orleans. I went left there with a, a young A&R guy from Arista, he and I decided to do that. And we did that for a couple of years. And then that was, that was basically it. Then I really had, had enough uh, of the music business, I guess, at that point. It's still a pretty good run, though. I mean, yeah, yeah, not bad. Yeah. <laughs> My wife calls me Forrest Gump because I never had a plan. You know, it was always kind of, oh, what am I doing now? And uh, you know, gosh. But uh, I was very, very lucky, and um, I think that is kind of the overriding theme of all of it. To find myself as a young guy who really, you know, it sort of dropped into this situation with these particular artists who were so talented, you know, from, from Dylan to, to Janice and the band. I mean, you couldn't ask for, for a better uh, roster than that to be working with. And I was just really lucky. A lot of it was luck. What do you think is the power of music? The what? The power of music. What do you think that is? The power? I'm not sure what you mean by that. What do you mean? What, what, what does music do? Oh, for the world? well, you know, I think it's it's it just crosses so many different borders with everybody, and the same is it holds true in the same way for people that are into 
whatever type of music they're into, whether it's country or bluegrass or rock and roll or jazz, it's you just know it when you feel it. It's something that talks to you internally, and it's something that you, you know, I think it just is a thing that it exists in our life to make us happy. And there's very few other things that you can say that about. I mean, music is there to make you to make you happy, and it makes you dance, and it makes you sing. And it doesn't matter what kind of music you like. It's all pretty m well connected anyway. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a question of wh what you're exposed to when you grow up and what kind of music. You know, I, I never was into hip hop or rap, but um, I think that the, the people that are have that same, you know, kind of gut feeling that you get from when you first hear something that just drives you nuts. I mean, every artist that I ever knew who was a young um, musician, uh, these guys, they couldn't deny it. It was like they couldn't get away from it. And I think that was kind of how I felt. The first time I heard uh, Chuck Berry or Gene Vincent, and, and even those early, early pioneers that came along, uh, you just, you got caught by it. And that was it. Last question is, um, how does it feel to have a photo exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? It's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the most unexpected thing that's ever happened to me. And it's also one of the most thrilling. And as I said downstairs, this is the holy grail if you've ever been involved in the music business. The fact that it's my photographs that become the legacy is kind of beside the point because I'm proud of them and I'm really thrilled that that's what brings me here. But um, just to have any kind of a attachment to this place and to have an exhibit of, of my work and to have the opportunity to sit up here and tell the stories and talk about it and so forth, it's just, it's really, uh, something I, I can't really put into words beyond my imagination. I'm really excited about this and I'm, I, I'm really having a hard time being humble um, about it because it's just, it's a thrill. And I'm, I'm so appreciative to you and to Greg and to Waka and uh, Joe and all the people that worked on, on the exhibit and did such a beautiful job showing the, uh, the photographs and um, you know, it's, can I say? It's, it's wonderful. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to open up to any questions. Yeah, mic's in the back. Okay. I can't really see if there's Lights somebody. All right. I'm just interested. I have one over here if that one's not working. I was interested. Uh, I could tell by one of your uh, uh, negatives that you were shooting 35. What kind of camera were you using? I had a Pentax. Um, it's a single lens reflex, 35 millimeter, and I was shooting Tri-X film. And I, and I was pushing it from 300 to six or 800, probably. Uh, you know, and the, no, no flash, no, all available light. And almost all of them full negative. Yeah, just, and I think I had two lenses. I, I can't remember, but I think I had a 125 and I had a, a 55. But some of them look so up close because I was up close. You know, most guys would have a 200 or a 300 and you could get, you could get the same picture, but um, yeah. Hello. Um, first of all, <coughs> I have enjoyed tonight so much. Thank you. This is just beautiful and wonderful. <laughs> you know, sometimes on NPR, it's like you, you hear Terry Gross and they're talking. But this is even better. So, I don't know. And, and when you tell a story, I am just so drawn in. It's amazing. But could you make a condensed version? I know it's in a book about your the 
Dylan and Otto Prominger story. Can that? It can be the yeah. short. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and tell you. Okay, I'll tell it as quickly as I can. I had re I had really just joined Albert Grossman a um, couple of months before this happened, and as I said, it was right around the Nashville Skyline album time, and. Albert was spending more and more time up in Woodstock. He called me up one morning, and it was a snowy morning. It was like 8 o'clock in the morning. He called me up, and he said, uh, I'm snowed in in Woodstock. I'm supposed to meet <coughs> uh, Bob Dylan at um, Otto Preminger's townhouse for breakfast and to screen a movie uh, that he's thinking he wants Bob's music to be in. So um, he says, I'd like you to meet Bob on the street and uh, take him in, into Preminger's and, and uh, uh, view the movie and have and have breakfast with with uh, Preminger. So I said, "Great, fine." Now, I had never met Bob Dylan. This was the day I met Bob Dylan, and so he, he, ten o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> cab pulls up and Bob gets out, and the two of us introduce ourselves and we walk up to Preminger's. We go up uh, this little tiny elevator uh, in his townhouse where Preminger was sitting there and he had, he had it all rigged up so that you, you know, to put on a little show as to the, you know, the curtain coming down and the thing coming out of the ceiling and there's a little picture behind him that slid and the projectionist behind it. It was all tricked out, <coughs> real Hollywood. And, uh, he finally he leans into this microphone. He goes, "Roll him," you know, right? something like right out of uh, the B movie kind of thing. Roll him. So this movie starts playing, and this is a rough cut of a movie they were doing that was in production. They had flown this movie from California just for Dylan to look at and hopefully give his approval to have his music in it. We watched this thing for an hour and a half, and it was as close to unwatchable as a movie could be. And it was a rough cut, so we knew it wasn't going to be great, but it was horrible. And it was uh, who, Do You Love Me, Junie Moon, uh, with Liza Minnelli. Got to be top 10 worst movies ever made. Um, and you know, I'm looking over at Bob, and he's like, you know, he's, he's falling asleep, and I'm looking at Preminger, and he's like, he can't get enough, and he's loving it. And I'm going, what am I doing here? This is this is insane, because the thing was so awful. And and so anyway, make a long story short, we go downstairs into this room underneath the the ground floor where there's a, a garden room that he had converted. It was like sort of outdoors and indoors, but he, it was winter and it was snowing, but. You felt like you were kind of outdoors, but it was warm because <coughs> he had it all glassed in. And um, the three of us are sitting at this table, and he rings a buzzer, and out comes this chef with the tall hat and the whole thing at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and um, so he takes uh, he takes our order, and he says to Dylan, uh, what, what would you like? And Dylan goes, well, what do you got? So he goes through this menu, this huge menu, and Bob orders and I ordered. And Grossman had told me, he said, you know, you're going to be, you're going to have to be the person that makes the conversation. He says, because Bob won't talk. He doesn't say anything. And, uh, <clears throat> and I don't know about Preminger. Preminger doesn't talk very much either. And now I'm like this kid. I had never met Bob before. Preminger is this guy who made Man with the Golden Arm and Exodus and a number of classic movies. And he's this imposing guy with this deep German accent and uh, kind of scary. So the idea of me carrying the conversation was intimidating enough. So we're sitting at the table <clears throat> and uh, and so he says, uh, af after we had some stuff to eat, and <clears throat> he says, to, to, he turns, oh, oh, I was trying to make conversation. That's what I was talking. And I said, uh, I said, you know, Otto, I, uh, I saw you on, on TV last night on The Tonight Show. And uh, 
you know, you were talking about too much violence in the movies and how terrible that is and stuff. I said, how do you square that with the guy throwing battery acid in the girl's face and blinding her? And he goes, that is not violent. <laughs> you know? so, so Dylan leans across the table and goes, hey, Otto, that is pretty violent. <laughs> it's like the first thing that Dylan said the whole day. <laughs> so, so Preminger bangs his fist on the table and he says, so? Do you want your music in my film or not? So now I'm waiting for the, you know, check, please. <laughs> <laughs> so Dylan looks at him and he goes, well, Otto, he says, uh, I don't know, he says, I liked it. Dylan Preminger says, yeah. He says, uh, but I don't know. He says, I think I got to see it again. <laughs> oh, man. He could have knocked me off my chair <laughs> with a feather. <clears throat> Preminger says, what? You just saw it. Bob says, yeah, I know, Otto, but I got to see it again. I really do. I, don't, I can't make up my mind. So Preminger is like, now he's furious, right? And <laughs> so he says, the film is on its way back to, to uh, those days, Idlewild Airport. And uh, you know they're holding the plane for this film. The production is stopped. It's costing tens of thousands of dollars a day to hold up production. So Bob says, "Well, I don't know uh, what you're going to do, um, Otto, but I got to see it again." <laughs> so he, hit, he pushes another button, and out comes this little guy with a suit on and stuff. And Preminger goes, "Stop the plane!" <laughs> The drama was wonderful, <laughs> and, and so the kid runs out, and uh, and they got now they got to call the airport and, and the courier and get the film back and keep and then shut down production for another day, and uh, so Preminger says to Bob, he says, well, "When do you want to see the film?" And Bob said, uh, "Well, I was thinking maybe uh, me and my wife would come come by and have dinner at night." And, and watch the movie. So he says, okay, what time do you want dinner? And so Bob says, eh, seven o'clock. He brings the thing, out comes the chef, you know. <laughs> what would you like for dinner? What do you got? <laughs> Goes through the whole thing. <laughs> and then, so it's all set for seven o'clock, right? Then he's gonna watch the movie afterwards. So, Bob turns to Preminger and he says, oh, uh, Otto, one more thing. Preminger goes, what? He says, you can't be here when we come. So Preminger says, what do you mean I can't be here? He says, I live here, this is my house. <laughs> so Bob says, I know, but I, I just don't want you to be here. You can't be here. And for dinner, too. <laughs> so, Preminger, I thought Preminger had a fork. He would have stuck it right in his neck. He didn't even know who Dylan was, I don't think. You know, somebody told him, you got to get Bob Dylan's music for them. So, he agrees to it, right? Now, I don't know what's going on, because this is like another universe. <laughs> so... That was that was the way that ended, and then we go we go upstairs, and Bob and I go outside, and we're walking down the steps of the of his townhouse, and I said, Bob, help me, please tell me what just happened. I said, that was the worst piece of crap I've ever seen in my life, and you were asleep for most of it, but when you were awake, you hated it. He says, I, I know, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> so I said, are you really coming back tonight? He said, yeah. I said, are you going to have dinner? He said, yeah. He says, that room downstairs, he said, you know, Sarah and I are uh, we bought a townhouse in the village and we're redoing it. And he says, I really dig what he did down there. With the <laughs> and I want her to see it. Oh, and I said, are you going to watch the film again? He says, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was the day I met Bob Dylan. Uh, I think that was the right job. <laughs> well, thank you.
Thank you, Ken. Thank you for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.